there'd been a suspicious death in a youth hostel in the north of Brittany. Caroline's body was found. She had been raped. Why didn't we arrest him before? Tonight, how remarkable detective work in America helped solve the murder in France of a British schoolgirl. A father's fight for justice, a trail that had gone cold, and the amazing chance discovery that put a killer behind bars for life. In the summertime, Brittany is a, a wonderful place to visit. It's the sort of place where children come for family holidays. Many, many uh, thousands of British school children came to France on school journeys every year. It's the sort of place which is regarded by schools as being a safe place. On the 18th of July, 1996, a school trip from Cornwall was enjoying a stay in Brittany. On that particular day, they'd visited Mont Saint-Michel. Among the party was Caroline Dickinson, a 13-year-old student from Launceston College. She was really the girl next door. A very ordinary girl, according to her parents and all her friends I've spoken to. She used to go to brownies or, or girl guides with her sister, younger sister, Jenny. Uh, a big home girl. She, she liked everything about the home and her family. They were on holiday in France. Uh, it was a foreign country. They'd seen things they'd never seen before. They were having a wonderful time. She hadn't been away from home by herself before. And when she went on this trip, her mother hadn't been too keen. Her father agreed to, to make a contribution. Caroline saved her own pocket money to go. The party was staying at a youth hostel in the small village of Plain Fougere. A very sleepy, small, rural village. One or two shops, a couple of bars. The auberge, been there for many years. On the evening, Caroline Dixon sang songs with her friends. They were excited. They were sleeping together in a foreign dormitory in a foreign country. The smells were different. It was a very hot night, and the stars were in the sky. And Camilla, this other girl who was in a bunk uh, above Caroline, who was on a mattress on the floor, uh, eventually told me that the last thing she remembers is, is them, all of them, including Caroline, looking out at this uh, beautiful black night with the, the stars and Caroline singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. They were probably the last thing she said and they, they all drifted off to sleep. They'd had a wonderful adventure and then during the night this horror scenario had to happen. A British schoolgirl has been raped and suffocated on a school holiday to France. Four friends of Caroline Dickinson, who was 13, woke up to find her murdered in her bed in the dormitory they were sharing. The attack happened at a hostel in a small Brittany village where the group from a Cornwall school were staying. I don't think I shall ever forget that morning. I had a phone call from the sous-prefecture uh, advising me that a schoolgirl uh, on visit to France with a group of children had died and uh, they would appreciate uh, my presence. And. Subsequently, the name Caroline Dickinson was, was given to the, the victim of, of what uh, very rapidly uh, uh, transpired to, to, to be a murder, and a murder uh, committed under horrific circumstances. As the news spread, the small Cornish community of Launceston was stunned. It was a town in absolute and utter shock. Um, I remember talking to Caroline's grandfather very briefly but to walking around the town and trying to talk to uh, other children and parents and so on, everyone really was just too stunned to talk. The college is devastated by the news of Caroline's death. Caroline was a lovely girl. She worked hard, she had lots of friends, she always had a ready smile. She was quiet, she was gentle. She was a credit to our college. The headline was something like every, every parent's worst nightmare. Uh, it was uh, a nightmare for the, for the Dickinson family. It was every parent's worst nightmare. There were 40-odd kids on this trip who, who suffered horribly, and their parents must have gone through uh, 
you know, hell, because they had the briefest of conversations. And you can imagine the state, the, the girls and the, and the two or three boys, but the girls in particular were on. For Caroline Dickinson's parents, John and Sue, the nightmare was worst of all. I was informed they would be uh, arriving. I took them away to a quiet hotel and I did my best to put pressure on the, uh, the, the commanding officer of, of the gendarmerie force there um, to, for Caroline's uh, parents to see the body, which they wished to do. The murder had sent shockwaves through the local community of Plan Fougere. Gendarmes, uh, who I knew, uh, you know, from uh, the years of, of my work, uh, come up to me and say, we'll get the, you know, we'll get not to worry, we'll get, they were furious. I'm such a, uh, you know, a tender young kid and uh, it was just awful. It's awful for France. As the investigation got underway, crucial questions were being asked. How on earth could a predator, under those circumstances, uh, have entered that room occupied by five teenage girls? How on earth could he possibly have committed uh, a crime like that without the other uh, four girls in the room uh, hearing anything or waking, waking up? All berges are kept open for security reasons. There is always an open door, fire or something like that, an emergency to evacuate the place by law. That was the rules at, uh, at the time. The two witnesses who were eventually called, two of the other girls in the room, one uh, felt she heard uh, Caroline uh, moaning, just thought she was having a nightmare. One of the other girls half felt she saw a shadow and thought it was Caroline or one of the other girls going to the toilet. In the first few days after the murder, Plan Fougere was swamped by local gendarmes, desperately hunting the killer. The man in charge of the investigation was Judge Zaug. But from the beginning, his inquiry was shrouded in secrecy, even to the Dickinson family. In the early stages of the, the investigation, there was, a, there was a wall, a blank wall. As far as we, we, we as journalists, attempting to, to, to cover this case, we were told absolutely nothing about any uh, of the uh, witness reports. In a similar situation in England, there certainly would have been press conferences and the police certainly would have perhaps referred to the statements of witnesses. But Judge Zaug's methods appeared to bring quick results. French police took just two days to catch the man they say has confessed to killing Caroline Dickinson at this youth hostel. At a press conference, the French magistrate who led the murder hunt gave details of the man they're holding. The suspect is believed to be a 40-year-old drifter already convicted of a previous rape. The man who confessed to the murder was a local vagrant, Patrice Padet. Patrice Padet was a, a man with previous sexual... Uh, convictions, quite serious uh, sexual, sexual com convictions. He was a man with an alcohol problem, he was a man with a drug problem, he was a drifter. He'd been picked up by, by a gendarme in a van who actually stopped to give him a lift uh, and then realised that he, he corresponded with a, with a photo fit. They were very, very pleased indeed that uh, within a few days, well, I think it was within a week, they had uh, caught somebody. But hopes for a quick resolution to the murder were soon to be dashed. DNA tests were carried out on Pade, and the, the, his genetic profile was compared with the uh, semen found uh, at the scene of the crime on, on, on Caroline Dickinson's body. Unfortunately for, for Monsieur Zog, and unfortunately for the uh, initial team of investigators, Patrice Pade had been uh, cleared by the DNA test. His DNA profile didn't correspond with the profile of the murderer. Events proved, and very quickly, that he was not the perpetrator. They were back to square one. In July 1996, Caroline Dickinson, a 13-year-old student from Cornwall, was raped and murdered in a tiny French village while on a school trip. After the first prime suspect had been proved innocent, the French police, led by Judge Zaug, were still hunting the real killer. Back in the town of Launceston, Caroline's funeral took place. 
the, the church, which is just off the square in Launceston, was just absolutely packed. And not, not just everybody from the school, including all the poor children who were on the trip, uh, but, but many of the sort of townsfolk. This girl was one of their own. It's not a huge town, Launceston, and uh, the town all felt that they'd suffered a grievous loss. Everyone hoped Caroline's killer would soon be caught. But as the months passed by, it seemed little progress was being made. 8 a.m. in the village of Plenforger, the time and the place Caroline Dickinson was found murdered. One year on, there are no reminders of the schoolgirl who died here, no leads to the man who raped and suffocated her. They were trying very, very hard, but of course it was too late because all of their, the, the, during the, the first uh, crucial days of the, the inquiry, all of their attention had been on interrogating Patrice Pade. Ever since her murder, Caroline's father, John Dickinson, had made numerous public appeals for help. I have come here to appeal to the people of Brittany for their help in finding the perpetrator of this monstrous crime. And I would plead for anybody who might have information to please come forward urgently to the judge or the police. It was very much the urgings and the promptings of, of John, particularly on his visits and through his French lawyer, that, that, that gave the, um, the, the French a kick up the butt. John Dickinson was becoming increasingly frustrated with the progress of the French inquiry. I really do think that the English public at large had this vision of these, these, these bungling Inspector Clusos, uh, you know, getting nowhere and just making fools of themselves, and it really felt like that. He'd become more and more convinced Judge Zaug's leadership of the investigation was the problem. Uh, as time's gone on, his um, arrogance almost has got to me, and uh, it is really rather annoying. In what way? Uh, in that he, he, he seems to feel that he doesn't have to inform anybody about what he's doing, that he is a law unto himself. To many, it seemed John Dickinson was keeping the investigation going single-handedly. Here was a man who was extremely determined. Uh, he spoke little or no French. He was in a land he didn't know. He was faced with a judicial system, a legal system, which, which was a mystery to him. Mr. Dickinson became convinced that the French investigation was deeply flawed on a number of counts. Crucial witness statements were ignored. Vital fingerprints from the murder scene were never taken. In the critical first few days following the murder, routine door-to-door -door inquiries were not conducted in Plain Fougere. And critically, his request that the authorities test the DNA of the local male population was denied by Judge Zaug. Eventually, John Dickinson had had enough. The Dickinsons went to the Foreign Office with one simple demand, put pressure on France to find our daughter's killer. I'm hoping that uh, the French will realize that uh, we do not intend to sit back and, and keep quiet about this. In August 1997, after a legal action brought by John Dickinson and intense media pressure, Judge Zaug was sacked. We are very pleased, very pleased indeed with the news uh, that uh, the Court of Appeal have uh, decided to take over the case. His replacement was Judge Rohenbeck, who promised a fresh start to the inquiry. The fact that there was a new judge on the case was directly due to legal action uh, taken by the Dickinsons. When I got the file, I read the file for, first, but we didn't have a foot of it. We didn't have... Um, leads. Uh, it was a very difficult case. Uh, it was one year later. So um, I had to, to have a new look on the, on the file. Progress was swift. Rombeck immediately ordered fresh door to door inquiries in Plan Fougere, plus the re interviewing of the key witnesses to Caroline's murder. This produced a new photo fit of the killer which was quickly made public. The judge also granted John Dickinson's request to DNA test the male population of Plain Fougere, something which caused quite a stir. Because it was the first real mass DNA testing uh, that had ever happened in, 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 in France. We saw images of old French men, uh, I say old French men, middle-aged French men in, in, in their jackets and their berets walking into the uh, the town hall where the DNA tests were, were going to take place. There was a certain pathetic element to it. One, one, one saw these, these perfectly innocent uh, men who, who 
were going to be DNA tested, who were, who were quite worried about the situation because they, they thought to themselves, well, what if they get it wrong? <laughs> but the DNA tests proved negative. They had failed to identify a suspect. John Dickinson maintained he was totally convinced the killer was a local man. But it seemed he was wrong. But if the killer was not a local man, then who was he? And it was then that Judge Rowanbeck made a discovery that would change the whole focus of the investigation. He made a startling connection with an incident in the nearby town of Saint Lunaire. In Saint Lunaire, it's, uh, that was the key for me, it was, uh, the case, it was Saint Lunaire. In identical circumstances, on the same night that Caroline Dickinson was murdered, a man had walked into a youth hostel in Saint Lunaire and entered the room of four sleeping students. But here, the outcome was very different. He, he had problems because the, the, the teenagers in the room, in the bedroom in uh, Saint Lunaire, uh, switched on the, the light and uh, asked him, what do you do here? Having failed in his first attempt in Saint Lunaire, it seemed the attacker had then driven the 25 kilometers to Plan Fougere, where he murdered Caroline Dickinson. So my, my first job was to get the second file because the, the two files were not, were not linked until that. So I wanted to read this file in order to know if it was a man who was involved in two facts or only one fact. The link between the two attacks had been completely ignored by the original investigation. But Judge Rombeck's discovery had thrown the case wide open. It was very different because if he was only linked in Plain Fougère, it could be a man from Plain Fougère. But if we have, if we had two facts, it could be a man from, from outside, not, not from Plain Fougère, but perhaps from, from Saint Lunaire, or from Brittany, or perhaps from uh, far. And that, that was the, the worst hypothesis for, for me. The second attack in Saint Lunaire was so similar to the one that killed Caroline Dickinson that Judge Rombeck believed a profile was emerging of a sexual predator with links to youth hostels. I had four criteria. A man who was a rapist, a man who attended youth hotels, a man who was in plein fougère. The fourth was a man who looked uh, like the photo fit. I thought that if I had the, the four criteria on the same man, it was a good man. But we never had that. The search then widened further to include the whole of France. He sent messages out to all the youth hostels in France, to all the gendarmeries in France. He asked them to relate details of any sexual crimes, any crimes which had been committed against uh, young girls, young people, young persons in youth hostels all over France. That was a lot of people. I got a very big file from that. The aim was to generate a list of suspects whose DNA could be tested against the sample found at the original murder. In Plain Fougère, we tested uh, 400 people, uh, but the, the global amount of the people tested in that case, more than 3,000. I was afraid from the beginning it could be a man who, uh, who looks like the photo fit, uh, who was staying just near the youth hotel was known as a rapist and we didn't see him. That was my, my, uh, my fear, my, <laughs> my fear. The DNA testing of the 3,000 men was a very slow process. It took more than two years. But gradually, one name kept coming up in their inquiries. Francisco Arce Montes, a 47-year-old Spanish national who'd been arrested in France in 1994 for attempting to attack a girl in a youth hostel. His description also matched the photo fit. And despite appearing to have no connection to Plan Fougere, he became the investigator's prime suspect. Van Rombecker had, had a record of this man having been arrested in La Croix de Touraine. One of the aspects which fascinated him was the fact that the person in question, Francisco Arte Montes, had, a, had something like between 10 and 12 youth hostel cards this was a man who travelled around uh, youth hostels uh, for years, who, who, was a, who, who was an habitué of, 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 of youth hostels. It was the last man. Of course, at, 
at, at that time, he became very suspect because it was among the last people who have not been tested and I think at that time it was the more interesting. The only problem uh, was that uh, it was, it was uh, impossible to trace uh, Francisco Arthur It was the worst of the hypothesis of the, the beginning. It was an international uh, migrant. He went in many countries. Very difficult, uh, this type of people to, to identify, to, to, found, to find. The name Francisco Arce Montes was circulated to all the police forces of Europe, but there was no trace of him. It must be said that in 1999, 2000, things were looking pretty glum. There was a list of suspects. They'd whittled down the list of suspects. They had the name Francisco Arce Montes. He was perhaps the prime suspect. Perhaps he was the only man they had failed to trace, but nobody could find him. To many working on the case, it appeared the trail had gone cold. A lot of people had lost hope. Certainly I uh, was guilty in, in so far as I perhaps uh, had, had thought to myself, well, I don't think they're ever going to catch this guy, really. I think perhaps it even, might even have crossed John Dickinson's mind. And perhaps he thought, well, will they ever catch uh, Caroline Dickinson's killer? But then, on the 1st of April 2001, nearly five years after the murder, an article appeared in the Sunday Times. In this article, the name Francisco Arce Montes was made public for the first time. This was to prove a vital turning point in the investigation. I was working with the Canadian police in a job that took me to another terminal trying to track an individual off of a flight. Having finished that, I came back to the terminal where I worked, stopped by and picked up a newspaper at the British Air counter. I was taking the newspaper upstairs since it was almost noon. I says, well, I'll get a coffee and a donut, and that'll be my lunch, and I'll read the paper and have at it. Thumbed through it, and I saw the story about Caroline Dickinson, the five-year anniversary edition of, the, uh, of her murder over in France. And I remember having read about that in the past, and I was very much surprised that they hadn't tracked down the killer yet. I thought they would have had him a long time ago, and as it was, they didn't. But this time in the newspaper, they gave a name, Francisco Arce Montes. And I said, well, let's just run this guy and see if maybe by chance he's ever been to the United States. Caroline Dickinson was raped and murdered while on a school trip to Brittany in 1996. Her father, John Dickinson, had led a tireless campaign for justice. However, in 2001, her killer was still at large. On the other side of the Atlantic, U.S. Customs Officer Tommy Ontko had read an article in the Sunday Times in which a suspect's name had been mentioned, Francisco Arce Montes. On a hunch, Tommy decided to run this name in his computer. Much to his surprise, he got a very close match to the name. But when it came up on our system, initially, it wasn't quite as the London Times was. It was uh, Arce. Montez as the surname and Francisco as the first name and within just a very few minutes of running those checks we determined that somebody with that name and a date of birth that would be consistent with the news article published date of birth or year of his age had actually made an entry to the United States. Some more computer checks started coming back and it indicated that a person with the name and date of birth, who I originally ran a very, a very close date of birth, just flipped date of birth, had been arrested down in Florida. Just two weeks before Tommy's discovery, it was a sunny March afternoon on Miami Beach. Two young backpackers on holiday from Chile were enjoying the last rays of the Florida sun. Around six o'clock, one of the girls stayed on the beach while her friend returned to their room at the youth hostel, the Banana Bungalow. The Banana Bungalow is a, a youth hostel. It, it's got about 100 rooms. It, it's got four beds to a room, a uh, community restroom. It's basically for students, young people, backpackers that are traveling through, very inexpensive. You have to bring your own sheets, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, it's uh, exchange students, basically. Later that evening, 
The other girl also returned to their room. The man was challenged and claimed to have mistaken the ends of the wrong room and quickly disappeared. Although scared, the girls did not report the incident. Also on holiday in Miami, and staying at the Banana Bungalow, were four Irish students. After a day on the beach, the group had returned to their room where they were getting ready for a night out. During the evening, a man was seen acting suspiciously in and around the hostel. After enjoying the Miami nightlife, the girls returned to the hostel around 2 a.m. and went to bed. The very first call was um, the Irish girls calling 911, wanting to report a burglary and a sexual assault. I, I was notified by our communications section to go to the banana bungalow. I spoke to all the uh, Irish students, and they, they seemed extremely credible and legitimately concerned that something had occurred to them, and there was physical evidence as to the fact. Because we called this morning because there was some man in our room. They had gone to bed fairly late, and one of the uh, victims, one of the girls, woke up and found a towel placed over her, her pelvic region. Uh, she did not go to bed with a towel over, over her. She went to bed in uh, just wearing panties and a t-shirt. She also noticed that her panties had been moved, and what she told me, she felt uncomfortable uh, in, in her private area. She confirmed that you know, something had been uh, touched. She also felt that, that she had been penetrated sexually somehow. We conducted an investigation in which we uh, took some of her clothing as well as the bed sheets. We noticed immediately that on the bed sheets were uh, what we believed to be semen. Um, we sent it to the lab and uh, had it analyzed and it came back positive as semen. Captain Vasquez spoke with the two Chilean backpackers who informed him that an intruder had also entered their room the night before. The next day, an incredible coincidence. The two Chilean girls were shocked to see the man who had entered their room two days before casually walking by the pool. Uh, at that time, the, the student called 911 and several officers responded. The man was approached by the officers, but refused to give his name. You got any ID? Good. What's your, Over there. Oh, what's your name, sir? So he was arrested in connection to the attacks and taken to Miami Police Headquarters for questioning. Under questioning, he denied any involvement in the attacks at the Banana Bungalow, but did give officers a name. Francisco Arce Montes. He looked uh, like a 50-year-old uh, transient, you know, uh, not, not very well off, just uh, kind of a, a loner traveling. 
seeing the world, he says. He, uh, he also explained to me that he had spent a lot of time in South America, in Germany, in, in uh, France. During the interview, Montez made several strange and incriminating remarks. He said, is it illegal to accidentally, if you're drunk, break into someone's room? Uh, is masturbating a crime in the United States? Things that are odd, things that are, to me, laying down alibis. Montez was also DNA tested, and a police report was filed. It was this report that Tommy Ontko was to read later, with such great interest. When I read the police report, that's when I kind of got the chills, because it said that this individual was at a youth hostel, the same kind of a place that was in France, that he committed a sex crime. So it was very much like the, the M.O. of the criminal being sought in France. I wanted to get on the first flight to Miami and just go down to the jail myself that night to make sure that he was in jail, like they said he probably was because I did not want him getting away. I did not want him getting released. M-O-N, yeah, T-E-S. Tommy Ondko, acting on a hunch, had made an incredible discovery. But it was vital he could verify the man being held in Miami was indeed the prime suspect for the murder of Caroline Dickinson. He needed more information, and it was a race against time as Montez could be bailed at any moment. So Tommy then attempted to contact the French police, but the language barrier and time difference made this extremely difficult. On the verge of giving up, he spoke with a French police officer. She did not speak English and I don't speak French, but she did understand when I kept saying Caroline Dickinson. And she gave a series of numbers, half in French and half in English, that I copied down and I thanked her as much as I could, as well as I could, and called those numbers. The phone rang about half past eight at night. The number Tommy was given was, in fact, that of retired British consul Ron Frankel, who occasionally acted as translator for the local gendarmes. And I immediately apologized because it was like after six o'clock. I said, well, if I can help you, I will. What's it about? I can't tell you it's top secret. I said, I can't help you if I don't know what you're seeking. Well, he said, I, I really can't tell you. I said, I'll tell you what, uh, Mr. Ontko, give me a clue, give me a name, give me a place, a name, the subject matter. And Tommy said to me, with a, a, a very strong American accent, Flan Fugis. Oh, I said, Flan Fougere. Right, he said, your word. He says, well, it's the Caroline Dickinson case. Yes, we're in business. I told him what I did, who I worked for, and I read the article in the paper and explained that we didn't want to falsely accuse someone who might be an innocent person. So that's why we had to be correct in making sure we had the exact name and date of birth for the individual who was being sought. Ron agreed to help, knowing the importance of keeping Montez in custody in Miami. I said, is he still in prison? He said, I think so, I think so. I said, well, in between me seeking the gendarme, now I know what you want, it's vital. You check that the guy's in prison, and please, Tommy, do all you can to keep him in prison until the French can get their act together. Although it was the middle of the night, Ron set about trying to track down the officers still leading the investigation. After a succession of calls, he managed to finally make contact. In a strange twist of fate, the officers in charge were en route to England to appear at the inquest into Caroline Dickinson's murder and were about to board a ferry. I phoned, John Luke answered. I said, uh, have you got Caroline file with you? He said, yes, very important. You, you, something interesting? I said, more than interesting. I said, the guy you're looking for is reported in the British press. He's been located. I told them an immigration officer in the United States has found him. What he wants to know it's his date of birth. And they said, we'll find it for you, we'll find it for you. When Ron saw the results, compared to what I gave him, he didn't want to be the one to say, OK, this is definitely the person. So he said, Tommy, I want you to call the car direct just to make sure that there's no error and get the right information that you need from them. Called him up. They pulled over to the side of the road again. 
looked through the file to make sure there was no error. They gave me that. They told me um, the name, date of birth, where he was from in Spain. I was still very cautious at the time. I didn't really believe that it was that easy, if you will, and I really didn't uh, want to say that we had our guy. The name of the man being held in Miami and his date of birth, 14th of March, 1950, matched those of Francisco Arce Montes, who had disappeared from France some five years earlier and who was the prime suspect for the murder of Caroline Dickinson. Just before they got on the ferry in France, they, they really didn't have much. They were going to the coroner's inquest in the UK and pretty much, they were, I guess they were going to report that they had no new evidence. And by the time they got off of the ferry in Portsmouth, they had substantial new evidence that they might indeed have a suspect and they might have tracked him down. When my colleague called me, told me that, he told me he had been just uh, arrested uh, in, uh, in the States. But I had been so many times disappointed. I didn't believe <laughs> at the time. So I didn't want to believe that. Uh, it was only then when uh, I told him, uh, see the DNA. It's clear, it's his or not his DNA. But what was needed was scientific proof. Francisco Arce Montes was arrested for a sexual assault in Miami, Florida in March 2001. US Customs Officer Tommy Ontko identified him as possibly being the prime suspect for the murder of British teenager Caroline Dickinson in France five years previously. But his detention in the US was dependent on forensic evidence, proving he was indeed Caroline's murderer. Well, after the detainer was put on him, then the DNA testing commenced. The DNA testing was done at the Crime Lab Bureau in Miami by Sharon Hines. She'd already identified Montez as the attacker at the Banana Bungalow by matching his DNA to the sample found on bed sheets at the scene of the crime. But to prove he was Caroline Dickinson's killer, she needed more information. From talking to Tommy, I told him that I would need a DNA profile from a sample uh, from the crime scene. So uh, within a couple days, I received a fax that had a DNA profile on it from some evidence that was collected from the crime scene in France. So the DNA testing was done from our standpoint down there within, I think, two days. We run uh, quite a few sites of DNA because we want to be sure uh, that there couldn't be a random match between a couple sites of DNA. So in this case, uh, I ran some additional sites of DNA, and at that point, um, once we were each done with our testing, we had enough information to say that we thought that the samples were a match. But at that point, um, of course, the laboratory in France wanted their own samples so that they could confirm it. For a tense three days, everyone again held their breath. And a press conference had been called um, here in Rennes on the steps of the Palais de Justice to announce the results of the, of the DNA test. This was going to be the big moment, really. A lot of, a lot of people were hoping and praying that, this was gonna, that, that, that uh, he was the guilty man, that, you know, that this, this, this terrible affair was finally going to be resolved and that uh, Caroline's killer was going to, was, was going to be found. The DNA of Francisco Arce Montes matched the sample found at the scene of Caroline Dickinson's murder. For Father John Dickinson, it was the news he'd been waiting for for more than five years. I wouldn't like to, to say anything that's going to prejudice the uh, continuing investigation and uh, uh, the legal processes, but uh, you know, we're very happy with the way things are at the present time. The breakthrough obviously came when the DNA was matched in the US and in France. That was the match, that was the point. To that point, there was no 100% certainty that it was our suspect. From the beginning of this case, the only thing we were sure it was the test, the DNA test. The problem was to find him. I think those who really thought about it realized that um, here was a, a triumph, really, for John Dickinson, because John Dickinson had kept plugging away uh, asking for information. He kept doing interviews, he kept uh, speaking to the press. To all intents and purposes, John Dickinson's campaign for information, John Dickinson's campaign for justice, had, uh, had worked. It was a great success. But John Dickinson would have to wait for justice. It took six months for Montez to be extradited from the United States to France. 
and a further two years for the trial. At the proceedings, Montez admitted rape but pleaded not guilty to murder, claiming Caroline's death had been an accident and that he was mentally ill so was not responsible for his actions. For him, we, we said, he has full responsibility because he has the full conscience of what he is able to do. Even if he had drank some wine, some uh, alcohol, even if he was a drug addicted, he is responsible. On the 14th of June 2004, after a three-week trial, Montez was unanimously found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. The events of the last week have been, for us, necessary but extremely draining. And of course, has the, as has the pursuit of justice for Caroline over the last eight years. But the Dickinson's ordeal still wasn't over. Montez immediately lodged an appeal. A retrial took a further year to come to court in June 2005. Again, Montez was convicted, but lodged another appeal, which he later withdrew. This all happened after the shocking truth had emerged of just how dangerous Montez was. At his first trial and his second trial, his list of previous convictions was, was, was read out. It took something between five and ten minutes, really, to uh, read out the list of previous convictions. Over a 20-year period, Francisco Arce Montez had committed a catalogue of serious sexual attacks all across Europe. Four charges of rape in Germany, 14 suspected rapes in Spain, plus another attempted rape in France, all before murdering Caroline Dickinson. Here is an example of a pure sexual pervert, but a man who had found himself on a slippery slope of sexual perversion and uh, who never would have been able to uh, crawl back up that, uh, that, 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 that slippery slope. A pervert like him st stop only when we stop him because it's a, it's a way of life for him. It's deviant, of course, but it's a way of life. It is too late to change, and it doesn't win a change. I think he is very, very dangerous. The Caroline Dickinson case raised major questions about the levels of cooperation between police forces across Europe. Why wasn't he stopped sooner? Why wasn't he arrested? By, by the Spanish in the autumn of 1997. The name, his name was on, a, was on the desk of a policeman in, in Madrid, in Interpol in Madrid. Why wasn't, why wasn't he arrested then? The reason why he wasn't arrested then was because there was lack of cooperation between uh, the French, certainly between the French and the Spanish uh, police forces. John Dickinson himself has always said, continues to say, that there is not enough uh, cooperation between the various police forces of, of Europe. It was very difficult to find because he didn't have a, uh, he didn't stay a, a, in one place. Yes, we know that now that he was in the States, he, he was in London, he was in the Netherlands, so he was a traveler, a migrant, uh, very difficult, uh, this type of people to, to identify, to, to, found, to find. If I had been a member of Caroline Dickinson's family, my anger would not merely have been directed at Arce Montes. An accused cannot justify himself. However, a citizen watching the accused might well ask himself a few questions. Yes, here is someone who committed a crime, but isn't there an element of failure on my part or that of other citizens? Couldn't I somehow have stopped him before he committed the crime? It's a question which society has to ask itself, and if it doesn't, then this kind of thing could happen again. John Dickinson has always campaigned for an international DNA database, which would help combat criminals who move between countries. I think it's definitely got to be the way forward, and not just in France, but the whole of Europe. Um, any police officer in this country will explain the merits of it and how it's been beneficial in solving so many crimes uh, and it's only been up and running a few years it's got to be been, got to be the way forward it's not only whose time has come it's overdue and i think internationally the police community needs to ensure that the governments in all of their countries use this dna system to track down and identify criminals 
but Montez's eventual arrest and prosecution had demonstrated that when police forces across countries and even continents do work together, the results can be extremely effective, even if a little bit of luck is needed. There's good luck and there's bad luck in any case. When you have bad luck, you try to work around it. When you have good luck, you just take the ball and you run with it as fast as you can. And we had some very good luck on our side of the Atlantic with the case. It was not luck at the beginning because we made a lot of work in order to get this list. The first thing that Arsimontes was on the list. I don't think the gendarmerie uh, gave up hope because they came up with a name. Grinding police work, never giving up. Years, days, weeks, months, years. Sooner or later, the, the law catches up with you, if not your conscience, and it could be 5, 10, 15 years, but sooner or later, for, for a crime as heinous as this one, you, you will be caught and you will be prosecuted. The murder of Caroline Dickinson and the hunt for her killer will be remembered for the incredible series of events that led to his capture. But ultimately, it was due to the relentless campaigning of her father, John Dickinson, who never gave up the hope that the culprit would one day be caught and he would get justice for his daughter. First thing I'd like to say that this is about Caroline or Kaz as some of her friends knew her. Although her life was short, she was happy. We knew she had a life ahead of her full of promise. We have some wonderful memories that we will cherish and she will never be forgotten. <laughs>